I'm Jennifer Murtazashvili. I teach here at the University of Pittsburgh at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. Um, and just a little bit about myself and how I got interested in Afghanistan. I was actually started off as a Peace Corps volunteer in the country of Uzbekistan, which is not too far from Afghanistan. And when I was in the Peace Corps, I was stationed in a Tajik-speaking part of Uzbekistan. So I learned Tajik, which you learned about um, this morning. And uh, because I spoke Tajik, it's a dialect of Farsi, I was able to do research in Afghanistan. And I actually spent five years in Uzbekistan. Uh, then I went back to grad school, intended to become a Central Asianist. And then when I uh, wanted to go back to Af Uzbekistan, I couldn't get a visa because I had uh, spent three of those five years working for the U.S. Agency for International Development, working on democracy promotion projects. And because I had done that, I was on the Uzbek government's I think I was on their do not allow to enter list after there were some problems uh, between the United States and Uzbekistan. So I turned my attention to issues in Afghanistan and very similar issues uh, to the issues I was looking at in the rest of Central Asia, which is local government. And what I'm really fascinated by is how people can govern themselves when, the gov when governments are either too weak or too lazy or too incapable to govern on behalf of people. So today I'm going to give you a talk, uh, to give a talk on governance of the state in Afghanistan. It's really picking up where many of our lectures have sort of left off uh, this morning and this afternoon, talking about the history of the state, um, how people relate to the state in Afghanistan. Um, and I think there's no better symbol of that than this is Darlaman Palace. This is in Kabul. This was a palace that was built by the kings of Afghanistan. And for many people, who, who study Afghanistan, or many observers who come to Afghanistan, especially um, aid workers, UN folks, a lot of journalists. Um, they, they write a lot of stories about Afghan's history and the wonderful Darlaman Palace, and how over the course of several decades, Darlaman Palace was destroyed. And this is what Darlaman Palace looks like today. And this was destroyed during the Civil War in the 1990s that you heard about this morning, or oh, it, it was last night. Uh, during the Civil War that uh, Professor Barfield talked about. And many observers of Afghanistan really lament this. And they lament this destruction for many reasons. Well, obviously, the human and social capital that was destroyed uh, was horrific. Millions of people died during the war. But I think this shelled out building, to many people, represent shelled out government. That this is what government looked like, this beautiful European style of architecture represented the greatness that was Afghanistan. And we're going to talk about the evolution of architecture at the end of this lecture. Um, this style no longer exists. And what I'm going to ask you to, to think about is whether that style of government that was really presented by the monarchs in Afghanistan really ever existed outside of Kabul. So when when, uh, sorry, let's go back to Darlaman. When many people were, 2001, the United States and many other countries came to Afghanistan, Darlaman served as a very powerful parable for government in Afghanistan. The country had been destroyed. It's the country, the people had migrated elsewhere. Millions and millions of Afghans were in refugee camps in Pakistan and in Iran. They had begun returning to the country. The physical infrastructure was destroyed. So for many people, for many observers, and for many uh, now in the Afghan government, the country represented a tabula rasa, a clean slate. So how do you build government on a clean slate? So there are many plans. The state builders got to work. So how can we design sort of the perfect government system for this country? And remember, after 2001, we all had a lot of hope for Afghanistan. It was the good war. Right? Uh, there was a chance to liberate Afghanistan after the cruelties of the Taliban that we had all seen. And there were another set of assumptions that people made about Afghanistan. So not only was it a tabula rasa, but this is sort of a contradictory assumption that you, you see, um, that due to the vast migration, culture had changed in Afghanistan. And here are some pictures from the 1970s. You can see these women. Um, at Kabul University studying science. There's women at a record store in Kabul shopping for records. And these are sort of more contemporary photos of this is uh, Afghan Star. I don't know if any of you have seen this movie. 
It's a documentary. You can see it on Netflix. You can download it. Uh, it's, uh, Afghan Star is the Afghan version of American Idol. It's a, great, it's a great movie. I'd really encourage you to watch. It's a very popular television show in Afghanistan. Um, foreigners bringing peace building through skateboarding. Okay, it's uh, been a story that's been circulated by CNN. Former colleagues of mine set up this program in Afghanistan. So it's sort of a contradictory assumption to the tabula rasa that traditional society existed, it had been swept away, um, and that there was a new beginning, that these impediments to development no longer existed. And so that you could build a new society um, because those old structures had really disappeared. So what have we seen in the last 10 years or so? We've seen a real fluctuation in how uh, state building, how, how foreigners especially, how the Afghan government has approached the state building question. And there's two really uh, polar opposites. One, the picture at the bottom, that's called the Afghan National Development Strategy. And that's set up by the international community in cooperation with the government of Afghanistan to bring development to the country. And this is how all donor assistance is supposed to be organized. This is how the capacity of the government is supposed to be built. And you can see these nice pillars. Pillar one, uh, security, obviously the most important. Pillar two, good governance. And so they're developing and implementing the strategy at the national level, the provincial level, all the way down to the village level. Uh, and so this real top-down strategy, this is how development aid and assistance are supposed to build the government, this national consultati consultative process. Uh, but on the other hand, this sort of top, after several years of doing this top-down strategy, there are a lot of questions about whether it was working or not. That many of the assumptions that people had made about the nature of government, the nature of local governance, was there a tabula rasa, had everything been wiped out, had traditional structure gone away, a lot of people started questioning those assumptions and the people who actually put their, had their finger on the pulse of this question, at least who brought it to the attention of outsiders, were U.S. soldiers and coalition soldiers who are marked boots on the ground in Kandahar and Helmand, who aren't sitting in the bubble of Kabul planning the next development strategy. They're people who are you know, subject to crossfire who are engaging with villagers on a daily basis. And they said, this was uh, General Major, Major Gant, sorry, in the US Army who made several trips to Afghanistan, was deployed several times, and he started this blog called It's the Tribe Stupid, trying to point, uh, point attention, of the policymakers' attention that there's this tribal thing in Afghanistan and we don't really understand what it is and how it works and we're not engaging with it very well. And it stands in very stark contrast to the national development strategy, which really doesn't have a role for these really messy kinds of government, uh, governance structures at the local level. And I think this is a, a Professor Barfield's parable of Swiss cheese versus American cheese is the perfect analogy to what's uh, happening here. So this is the Swiss, the, the American cheese model where you try to find one size fits all government for the whole country with good intentions, right? You want to bring people together, you want consultation, you want to bring women, marginalized groups, everyone to the table so that Afghanistan can finally have a strong state. But then you have these tribal systems which are really hard to understand. And nobody knows what a tribe is anyway, right? It's a really difficult idea to wrap our heads around, especially as foreigners and outsiders these concepts and ideas aren't too familiar with uh, to us. So this idea of trying to build a state, a centralized state, a state that has capacity is nothing new. And you've learned about the Iron Emir, Abdurrahman Khan, who ruled Afghanistan from 1880 to 1901. And so the beauty of Abdurrahman Khan is he wrote a two-volume autobiography in English, which you can download for free on Google Books. And I'd encourage you to do it. It's a fascinating read. He's the story of his life, he, uh, how he was born, and, and the infighting in, in the royal family, and how he became king, and then how he ruled once he became king. So he's got these really fabulous quotes um, about his view and vision of government. And he said, he talked about how it was necessary to, br to build strong walls around Afghanistan to keep people out, to keep trade out. He refused to build railroads into the country because he was afraid that if there were rail, rail lines built into Afghanistan, it would be easier to conquer. 
And he talked about once he got these walls around the country, it was necessary to clear the country of the scorpions. And the scorpions the great op were the great obstacle to peace, and those were the hundreds of petty chiefs, plunderers, robbers, and cutthroats, he calls them. And so he wanted to break down this feudal, what he called a feudal and tribal system, and create a strong centralized state. So this idea that the government exists in Afghanistan is not a new idea. So what I want you to consider is that governance in Afghanistan was not a tabula rasa. A lot of us came into Afghanistan, myself included, with really false premises of the nature of government, the nature of the problem. Afghanistan has a very long history of government. Um, beginning with Abdurrahman Khan, who really was the first ruler of Afghanistan who sought to centralize the state. He created provinces. He created a system of public administration. Uh, he, he said, I'm going to stop this. You heard about the Turco-Persian uh, uh, model of governance where you had a king in, in Kabul and, had, and, and, and the king had his brothers and cousins in the provinces who would rule on his behest and sometimes compete with him, he says. Uh, and in his autobiography, he describes how he will keep his relatives and sons and brothers in Kabul and he'll appoint a professional system of administration to rule the provinces. And he was the first Afghan king to do that. So public administration, taxation, system of conscription was developed under Abdurrahman Khan. And of course, you heard about Amanullah, the great modernizer who tried to bring Denmark to Afghanistan in a day, um, who was deposed by Bacha Sakao in 1928. And you know, this summer, I was back in Kabul, and I was doing an interview with the mayor of Jalalabad, which is, we think it's the third largest city in Afghanistan. And in the mayor's office, he has a life-size portrait of Amanullah, the modernizer, right? The one who took his wife to France. And, and uh, Professor Barfield didn't mention yesterday, but that picture of his scantily clad wife was the cause of enormous rebellion against the king, that people saw these pictures. And that was something that fueled the fire that led to his deposition. Um, and I asked the mayor, I said, Amanullah, why do you have his why do you admire him? And he said, Amanullah, he gained Afghanistan's independence from the British. Because Abdurrahman Khan and the kings before him, Afghanistan was not colonized, but the kings received a healthy subsidy from the British. And so he stopped the British subsidy, and the subsidy was received in return for British influence in foreign policy. So Afghans uh, tied, uh, they tied their own hands in terms of making decisions about foreign policy. They, they gave the British um, uh, the, basically ceded control of foreign policy uh, to the British, and Amanullah put an end to that. So Me Afghan Independence Day is marked on the day that the, um, the Afghan government signed a treaty with the British putting an end to those subsidies. And so this mayor, he says, I admire Amanullah. He wanted to bring the country forward. He wanted to do it quickly, and he gained our independence. Um, but Zayir Shah, during the Musahiban period, government moved forward very slowly. There were governors in place. It was a fairly authoritarian system. Um, and then uh, Zayir Shah's cousin, who deposed him in 1973, really felt that the country was moving forward too slowly. And so he deposed his cousin in order to bring modernization to Afghanistan. And so, um, and, and then the communists who came to power, who, who deposed Zayir Shah, uh, who deposed Daoud, they said, well, he, Daoud's not moving the country forward fast enough. We can do it faster. And so the communists came to power, and they engaged in massive land redistribution. So of course the communists, they came with sort of their one-size-fits-all diagnosis of the problem. What's the problem? What's the, how, how would communists diagnose a social problem? They come to power. What's the issue? Inequality. Inequality. Workers of the world unite. Proletariat. OK, so this is the vision they had. They wanted to get rid of the, quote, feudal system in Afghanistan. And something you should know about Afghanistan, unlike other countries in South Asia, something that's very unique about Afghanistan, we'll talk about this later on, is actually Afghans have very high rates historically of land ownership and actually very equal, um, land is distributed fairly equally among Afghans. And a lot of this, people have tried to understand why this is the case, and a lot of it has to do with 
the, the tribal system, that how the, the way land is distributed through families, through tribes, through clan members, has resulted in very small parcels of land. Um, in some areas of the country, there were historically large land owners, but actually Afghanistan was not a feudal country. And this is sort of an established consensus of scholars of the country. So there wasn't a feudal system to depose. Um, but the communists decided to depose it anyway. And so what they, what they tried to do is get rid of all mortgages, collectivized agriculture, and get rid of the traditional system of government. And so the Taliban, when they came to the power in the 1990s, tried to do a similar thing. They had their own vision of government. They wanted to, to rule through religious clerics. So they swept away the traditional uh, rulers in the countryside, and they wanted to put their own mullahs in charge. And so they ruled the country directly through mullahs. And now we have the Karzai government today, which we talked about yesterday. It's a very central. The Constitution of Afghanistan is essentially a copy of the 1964 Constitution, which calls for a very centralized system of government. And so why did we copy the 1964 Constitution? Well, I think there was a lot of question about whether people would accept democracy, whether people would accept a constitution. And there was, it, there was at least the sense that what was happening in the 1960s was legitimate in the eyes of Afghans, so let's go back to this old model. Now we look at it a little more cynically and say, oh, Karzai was just trying to centralize authority and keep his opponents out, and that's why we had the centralized system. But there's a big debate about why the country has a centralized system. But it's important to note, we'll talk about this in a second, that all governors, all subnational government officials are appointed by the center. There are no elected executive officials in Afghanistan. So this is a picture a friend of mine took. Do you know what this, this is? Any guesses? It's not my office. I'll give you a hint. It's a local government office. What do governments do? Is it like titles or deeds? It's land titles. The AMLOC was an office of the Ministry of Finance that's responsible for registering land deeds. And, if, and I spent a lot of time doing research in district governments around Afghanistan. I spent about two years doing field research in Afghanistan for the first project I worked on, on village governance. And every district government I went to had an AMLOC. And the AMLOC continued from the, royal, the time of the royal family to the communist period to the Taliban period. Why? Everybody wants to know who owns what land. Even if you don't believe in private land ownership, as the communists did, it was really important to keep these titles. And you can see that they are in disarray. But this government function continued, oftentimes with the same government official keeping that job. It's a technical job. Nobody wanted the uh, illiterate peasant to keep the land titles. It was in everyone's interest that someone who was educated and someone who could read maintain land titles. So I did some research. I spent about, uh, I did a significant research project in rural Afghanistan looking at village governance from 2006 to 2008. And I did research in about 30 villages in the countryside across uh, 16 different districts. And I interviewed government officials, farmers, women, men, um, uh, NGO uh, officials to understand how people govern themselves when there's no government around. And one of the things that came up quite often from villagers who I spoke to, they said, you know, no one asks us to pay taxes now. And isn't that a funny thing? And a lot, I got the sense from many Afghans that they felt that they would be legitimate if they paid taxes. But no one's asking them to pay. Back in, they called call him Coco, Coco Zaire, which is Uncle Zaire Shaw, during the time of Uncle Zaire. Um, it was good government. The people collected taxes for the government and they gave it to the Karyadar. And we'll talk about the Karyadar in a second. Literally in Farsi, it means the one who owns the village, the one who keeps the village. It's an informal village leader. It's one of the different titles that Afghans have for an individual who's appointed by the community to represent community interests to the state. So the Karyadar would then take the district, the money to the district government, and then give it to the AMLOC, and that's how we paid land taxes. So the history of government in Afghanistan is actually quite deep. And people have social norms about government. And they have very strong ideas about the role of government in society. So now that we've sort of introduced the idea of government in Afghanistan, I just want to get into detail a little bit about the formal structure today. And then I'm going to talk about the informal structure as it exists today in rural Afghanistan especially. 
So what does government in Afghanistan consist of? Well, here's you know, Civics 101. You've got a president. You've got a national assembly, which has an upper house and the lower house. You have a female quota. 25% of the lower, of both the upper and lower house should be women. And in fact, in both two par uh, national elections they've had for parliament in Afghanistan, women have got above, have, have risen above the 25% threshold. I think it's about 30%. Um, and then you have a Supreme Court. Afghanistan has yet to have its Marbury versus Madison. Um, meaning Afghan it's not clear in Afghanistan what role the Supreme Court has. It wasn't until 1803 in the United States with Marbury versus Madison that uh, we in the United States figured out that the Supreme Court had the right to interpret law. Okay, So there's still battles about who has the right to do this. Now one of the, the, the legacies of so many different governments in Afghanistan is that there's a ton of different ministries. There's a lot of formal government. There are a lot of ministries. Why? Because you have the, the royal family, the monarchy, they have one government. Then the communists come, and they add a whole bunch of different ministries. Then the Taliban come to power, and they add even more in ministries. And I teach public administration here at Pitt. And one of the things I teach to my students is that once you create government, it's really hard to get rid of. And Afghanistan's a really e exemplary case of that. You have all these different ministries with um, competing and overlapping jurisdictions in a country that's pretty small. So when 2001 came, there wasn't a vast reorganization of this. Why? Because everybody was in a panic to get government in working order. Nobody stopped to think, maybe there should be a tabula rasa when it comes to the formal structure. But in fact, we just continued to support the existing government. And one of the reasons for that, because people weren't sure who would work in the government. So let's keep the structures as they were. People know them. People are familiar with them. This will bring peace. We need a state to bring peace. And that was one of the assumptions that was made. So one of the achievements, I think, you know, a Afghanistan is a formal democracy. Elections have been extremely flawed. But I think Afghans over the past 10 years have become a bit proud of what they've achieved to some extent. That at least that they can say they, they hold elections just like every other country in the world. And so they have had two rounds of presidential elections, two rounds of uh, national assembly elections, and they also elect members of provincial councils. Um, one of the problems with the formal system of government is they use this really complicated, um, actually it's not a very complicated voting system, it's, a, uh, it's called the single non-transferable voting system. And it's not a very good voting system for a number of reasons. Here's a ballot. Okay, and w one of the sort of uh, perverse uh, incentives of the SNTV voting system is it encourages a lot of people to run. So how many votes can this woman, how many think she, how many boxes can she check? She gets one. One. She can pick one person. So how is parliament elected? Imagine the state of Pennsylvania we're going to elect members of the House of Representatives. And how many, in, the, in Pennsylvania, how many seats do we have in the House? 18, because we have 20 electoral votes minus two, that's 18. So in Afghanistan, um, okay, so imagine in Pennsylvania, we're, we're using the Afghans' SNTV system. So the way it would work is the whole state of Pennsylvania would get 18 members in the National Assembly. And instead of voting by district, we vote as a whole state. And you get one vote. You could vote for one person. And then the top 18 vote getters, they represent Pennsylvania. So what it means is there's no constituencies. You don't know necessarily who represents you. It creates a lot of incentives. As you see this with SNTV all over the world, it creates huge ballots. And so what happens is you know, two or three people get huge amounts of the votes. And then the last 10, there's like they get 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. There, there isn't a lot of difference between them. Why use such a crazy voting system? Any ideas? More people would be more interested in the govern government if they had a chance to take part in it and run. OK, so it could encourage more people to be politically active. And who are you voting for here? People? You're not voting for parties. 
And remember, we talked about that nasty civil war and the Mujahideen parties that existed and the factions that existed. And there was a lot of reservations about those political parties. Because those, those militias, those Mujahideen factions that came to power during the 1990s or that fought the Soviets during the 1980s, they were called Hezb, hezb islami Hezb means party. So when you think about political parties in Afghanistan, people associate them with, with um, armed factions. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, also, it's a very simple method. Okay? Afghans are only about 25, 30% of the population can read. So you want a system that's fairly easy to understand. So I, I just finished a, another large research project in Afghanistan. Actually, the results are coming out on Monday. Um, and I'll, maybe we can post a link to the internet. This huge report, um, it's actually the largest public, largest public opinion survey that's ever been done in Afghanistan. Uh, surveyed close to 9,000 people uh, with a huge qualitative component. So we did a lot of focus groups and interviews to understand why people respond the way they do in the survey. So I'm a big believer in mixed methods, that you, you do survey research along with asking, doing interviews, and then you can really understand together why people feel the way they do. So th the purpose of the second research project I've been involved with has to do with elections and democracy and governance, to understand 10 years on, how do people understand democracy and government? And so there's an overwhelming sense from people that I got from the interviews that people were excited about democracy at first, but have become disillusioned with it. Um, that candidates, people who ran for office, people who got into power didn't really fulfill their promises. Um, there was also a lot of violence. So here's a woman, uh, a school teacher in Ghazni, this is southern Afghanistan. And one of the reasons I did interviews in, in Ghazni province is because it was a real flashpoint in recent elections. Uh, in, in the recent round of parliamentary elections, uh, it's a, the majority of the population we, is Pashtun. The top 10 vote getters, actually the top 20 vote getters in Ghazni province were all Hazaras, which led to a lot of protests from the Pashtun community. What, what explains this outcome? Too many Pashtun candidates? Too many Pashtun candidates? Okay, that's one. So they couldn't, there was no coordination. Okay. Read this slide. What's going on? People are intimidated, and especially the Pashtun population in Taliban-controlled areas. The Pashtuns stayed home. They didn't want to vote. Okay. Um, either they didn't believe in the government or they were intimidated by uh, the violence. So, you know, and so the, the Hazaras voted in, overwhelmingly, in overwhelming numbers, and this led to accusations of corruption. Because there, many of the, of the folks down in the South couldn't admit that there was voter self-voter suppression or suppression by the Taliban. Um, so over time, people have become disillusioned with the elections. And I'll share, you, share with you some of the results from the survey research. And here, this is, uh, now you have to take survey research in Afghanistan with a huge chunk of salt. Okay. Um, that, but people are, on average, so that's what we call random sampling. And this is a huge sample. And in fact, I went down to Fort Leavenworth, and I was presenting some of the preliminary survey results from this sharing with some folks in the government. I said, this is the biggest survey that's ever been done in Afghanistan. 8,620 8, people were, were interviewed. And they said, well, that's not the biggest survey done in Afghanistan. And I said, really? What, what other survey is bigger than this one? And they said, oh, we can't tell you about those. <laughs> so, <laughs> but this is the biggest open source survey that I know of in Afghanistan. You can see that people don't have a lot of confidence in their public officials. So, you know, when I say that, I'm not sure what the numbers would be like in the United States, right? We have really low, uh, Walesi Jirga, that's the lower house of the National Assembly, lower house of parliament. Um, you can see people have a little bit more confidence in president than they do in the parliament. That's not surprising. Um, but how does it break down by ethnicity? So you can see that the Pashtuns have a little bit more confidence um, in the president than other ethnic groups in Afghanistan, but not by much. They tend to be less dissatisfied with him than the other groups, but on average, they're not more satisfied with him than the other ethnic groups. The Hazaras, 
and we talked about the tensions between Pashtuns and, and Hazaras, you can see that they on average have lower confidence in the president. What about the uh, National Assembly? This is the Walesi Jurgets, the lower house of the parliament. And you can see not a lot of confidence, but the Pashtuns have the lowest, lowest level of confidence in the Walesi Jirga. Uh, the minorities tend to do better. The Uzbeks actually seem to have the highest confidence, and I explain that in the fact that the deputy speak uh, the speaker of the um, Walesi Jirga is an Uzbek. And so they tend to have a little bit more confidence in him right now. I think that's what explains the higher Uzbek confidence, but overall not a lot of confidence in the national elected bodies. Asking people, do you plan to vote in the next presidential elections? Half the population says no. Similar results when I asked them about um, the National Assembly elections. Okay. And you can look at this by ethnicity. Who's the most dissatisfied? It's the Pashtuns. They don't want to vote in the next presidential elections, even though Karzai himself is Pashtun. And there's an assumption, I think, that many Afghans make that the next president will also be a Pashtun. Okay. But here's, here's one of the, the most fascinating results for me. And this is where looking at multiple methods really helps us understand how people feel about things. Something is strange as democracy. And I don't know how you'd answer this question here in the United States. Are you satisfied with democracy? I mean, how many of you are satisfied with democracy in the United States? How many of you are very satisfied? How many of you are, are fairly satisfied? Fairly. How, how many of you are neither satisfied nor dissatisfied? I want to see hands. How, have you, how many of you are not very satisfied? How about not at all satisfied? Okay. And then how many of you believe that the United States is not a democracy? Okay. Well, this is a really fascinating result that only 1% of Afghans believe their country is not a democracy. Break this down by urban and rural. Look at this picture. So Professor Barfield this morning talked about differences in urban and rural attitudes towards a lot of different things. And I think this picture just captures the sentiment of what, what, what is democracy? So people in rural Afghanistan are obviously much more dissatisfied. It's a mirror image. It's kind of, I, I was really surprised when I saw this picture of just how different, it's night and day, the attitudes towards the government, towards the state, and towards democracy. So I wanted to understand what explains this. So I was actually looking at the interview data that helped me understand this. And what I found was that when people expressed dissatisfaction with democracy, why were they dissatisfied? Because they felt that the norms of democracy were antithetical to those of Islam. That democracy meant a set of social values and social norms that people were uncomfortable with. And a lot of this actually came from women. Here's a woman in, um, this is in Panjshir province, which is considered to be one of the more liberal. It's a Tajik. It's the home of Ahmed Shah Massoud. Democracy is freedom. And, uh, but the meaning of freedom, uh, let's see, democracy is the meaning of freedom, but most of the people are using this for purposes which demean and bring shame to the idea of democracy. That's why local people don't like this word and they regard it quite badly. Examples of the misuse of democracy are seen all the time in the broadcast of films on television. Girls are not covering themselves well. This is not in line with our traditions and culture. And over and over again, especially with women, I saw this come up, that people associated with democracy, there was one interview I recall uh, quite well, a woman said, women are going to weddings. You know, weddings are segregated by sex, and they're still showing up dressed improperly or they're dancing improperly at weddings. Okay, um, people, this is a, a, a religious instructor in southern Ghazni province who said democracy is broken and it's violated by the government. And democracy is an Islamic idea, but what they have in Afghanistan has no relation to Islam. The real democracy and Islamic democracy, but what they have here is false. But there was a group of people, and you can see from the survey results, it's about a third of the population is, sa is satisfied with democracy. And those who were satisfied with the state of democracy in Afghanistan associated overwhelmingly with economic growth and economic opportunity and jobs and reconstruction and a, a real contrast in life under the Taliban. 
And this is sort of the image that we have, right? Democracy and state building and building roads and bridges. That's what we wanted to do with all of our aid money, is build hearts and minds and have people associate democracy with opportunity. Um, and with security, right? So, and, but this woman, he, she talks about how she's illiterate. She doesn't understand what this democracy is all about. And for her, democracy means freedom. But if we can have freedom in the country, then you and I and all our children will be free and our government can, com can function in a calm and responsible manner. As a housewife, I can tell you that democracy has brought us nothing. Under the Taliban, we were confined to our house. And today, the situation is more or less the same. I'm unable to understand the true meaning of freedom and democracy. If I were educated, I would be able to understand both. And this is a sentiment I've gotten from a lot of, a lot of uh, people I've spoken with in rural Afghanistan is, I don't understand what this is all about. I just can't understand. So, but what's missing from this, this critique of democracy, none of the respondents in the survey, in the qualitative or the focus group discussions that we had, associated democracy with political process, political parties, a mechanism to keep elected officials accountable. It had to do with uh, you were satisfied or dissatisfied with it in terms of economic opportunities or social values. It had nothing to do with voting. It had nothing to do with representation. So democracy has been used over and over again by different governments as a slogan. What is democracy? The People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan. Those are the communists, right? They use democracy as a slogan. Zahir Shah, his 1964 constitution brought democracy to Afghanistan. Okay. So people have been hearing this word all the, for, for decades. So it has little meaning to them, and they haven't really um, had a lot of experience with representative government. So now I'm going to t go from the sort of the broad picture at the national level and really break this down to people's daily lives to help you understand how people govern themselves when there isn't government around. So the survey also asked people what is the biggest problem in their area? Okay, and you can see that people are overwhelmingly concerned with security and terrorism, but you can see that's followed closely by unemployment, economic issues, also government corruption. It's a very serious problem. How is government organized? Well, when um, provinces were first set up by Abdurrahman Hani set up five provinces. Today there's 34. Every time President Karzai runs for re-election, he promises to give the Hazaras two more provinces. Uh, he, he promised that during the last election and he didn't deliver. Um, I was in uh, Afghanistan over the summer doing an assessment for the US government on the future of subnational government in Afghanistan. And one of the questions we asked was the future of district government. Interviewed a government official who's responsible for local government. One of the questions we asked is, how many districts are there in Afghanistan? Nobody knows. It's uncertain. So we think there's around 398. There were 325 in 1979. Um, why, ha why are there more? Patronage. Um, there's 2,000. There were estimates of around 10,000 villages in the 70s, 20,000 in 2001, and today the Ministry of Rural Development says there's 40,000 villages. Why? More villages, more aid. Okay. Um, we've sort of gone through this, but how is government financed? The centralized system has enormous consequences for mundane things that we take for granted, for example, here in the United States. In the US, we have a very decentralized system of government. People tax, government officials tax the local level. Your school board decides what, what the curriculum is, how things are going to be taught. Everything's very decentralized here. In Afghanistan, local government authorities have no, no decision-making authority over their budget. They don't have the right to tax their citizens or retain that revenue. All money that's collected at the local level gets sent back up to Kabul. Kabul makes decisions about what province get, gets what, and that's allocated back down to the districts. It's a centrally planned economy. They still haven't changed much from the Soviet period. So as a result, nobody uses the system. Nobody uses the formal system of government because it's completely inefficient. These are fundamental things that weren't changed in 2001 because I think we were so concerned with security and maintaining peace and wondering whether people would even accept the government. 
that we didn't really, we weren't really thinking about these details. But the people who have enormous power in Afghanistan are the governors. And there's good governors and there's bad governors, but all the governors are appointed by President Karzai. And some of them are from the areas where they govern. Muhammad Atta in Balkh province is an example of someone who Karzai probably can't touch. He's got enormous legitimacy. He's from that area. He's a former Mujahideen commander. And he's built up Balkh province as sort of one of the uh, examples of development in the country. There's Ishmael Khan, who's actually not a governor. He was a governor in western Herat province, has also built up um, his region. Now, the only local government officials that have the right to collect and retain revenue are mayors. And so what you've seen in Afghanistan in the past 10 years is a proliferation in the numbers of municipalities. Little villages are proclaiming themselves to be municipalities. Why? Because they want the right to raise and retain revenue and make decisions for their community. But the most important government official, I would argue, in Afghanistan are the district governors. And these are the people who are the face of the government to society. And so one of the things you should remember is despite this very centralized form of government we see in Afghanistan, 10 years after 2001, or it's 11 years now, right? There still is no formal government at the village level. Formal government stops at the district level. There's no formal government in the village, even despite the fact the Constitution calls for it. Villages in Afghanistan are very, very small. And you can see if you were to create formal government structures throughout the countryside, you'd be paying for a lot of government. And there's a lot of questions as to whether Afghanistan can maintain this American cheese model of governance that goes from this Kabul to the provinces, to the district, down to the village level, to have the villages directly ruled by the government. But this has raised a lot of questions. So what is the nature of government in rural Afghanistan? If there's no government, well, there must be anarchy. There must be chaos, right, without the state. Or maybe Afghans just don't want the state. Afghans don't want government. So what I found from my research in rural Afghanistan is that actually Afghans have a very sophisticated way of governing themselves. And I call this the informal constitution of Afghan government, or Afghan governance at the village level. If you go to most villages in Afghanistan, you'll find a village council, which typically is a shura or a jurga, depending on what part of the country you're from. And this is a council of men in the village who come together to resolve disputes. You have religious leaders, mullahs for the most part, some peers, some Sufi leaders. And you also have this funny body called the Malik, or the Karayadar. And it has a different name depending on what part of the country you're in. And the Malik, people, re people describe the Malik to me over and over again in local languages as the person who's the bridge between the people and the state, the person who represents the community to the state. They would always call it a bridge between the people and the government. And so this is a self-appointed first among equals who represents the community to outside interests. Whether that's aid organizations, it's the government, this person is literate. Sometimes this person is elected. Sometimes the position's hereditary. A lot of times the person is a Sufi peer from a well-respected family. And that person maintains that position because of their respect in the community and their ability to get things done. You want to have a Malik who can do things for you. This Malik I found in Dedadi district in Balkh province. And the Malik here is a woman. And how did I find the Maliks? Well, every Saturday, Saturday is the first day of the working week in Afghanistan. And what I found during my time in villages was that I would pre when I'd go to a new district, I'd pre-select the villages I wanted to visit ahead of time. And so I knew that I could go to a district governor's office. And what I found out is every Saturday, or most Saturdays, the Maliks from the district would meet with the district governor to talk about different issues. Sometimes NATO forces were there summoning them. Sometimes the government was there summoning them. The government wanted to know what was going on in the area in terms of security. So going to one of these meetings, and I was waiting outside um, in the hallway, and this woman pops out. OK? And my colleagues thought she was a secretary or some administrative official. It turns out she was the Malik of her village. And she's a really amazing person. Um, she's run into some difficulties later, which I can talk about during the Q&A. Uh, but she drove a tractor. 
She was, she, she thought for sure that I was an aid person, came to her village. She had a guest room that she painted pink. And so all the men in her community had to visit her in her pink guest room. Um, and that's her husband who's very proud of her wife's efforts. Um, now that's obviously the exception to the rule. So people describe their Malik over and over again. Um, the Malik links the village to the government. The Malik is the bridge between the people and the government. Here's different names of Maliks that I found uh, from my travels in rural Afghanistan. And so in addition to the Maliks, people talked about religious leaders. These are the other important players in village governance. And remember, this is an informal system. I found Maliks all over the countryside, but nowhere is this written in a law. Nowhere is it written in a, in a formal document. But what was fascinating is most Maliks had a stamp issued from the state. And that was a decision made by many district governors to give Maliks a stamp so they had official government authority. But they weren't representatives of the state to the village. They were representatives of the village to the state. And it's a very, very different thing. So one of the, so religious leaders, I think you understand what mullahs do. We've talked a lot about them. But was something that was really fascinating to me in my interviews in rural Afghanistan were the number of jokes about mullahs that came up from villagers. And uh, Professor Barfield talked about mullahs needing to get fed before they resolved a dispute. And this was a common joke that came up um, about a mullah. Some people asked a mullah to come to their house because they had an issue that needed to be resolved. At the same time, another family asked the mullah to come to their house because they needed some advice. The first family told the mullah that they would prepare some soup for him. The second family said they would prepare some palau, palau which is a rice dish for him. The mullah couldn't decide between the two invitations, so he never showed up to either. He sort of paced back and forth between the homes. He would walk towards one house, smell the palau, but remembered the soup and would walk towards the house only to change his mind again. He ended up missing food at both houses due to his indecision. He then asked God to kill him because he missed all the food. And that was a joke that came up over and over again when people were describing their mullahs. And here's different names of religious leaders uh, that I found from my field work. And there's also village councils. And this is sort of, the, sort of the stereotype of Afghan village governance is you have a jirga, which literally translates from Pashto as a circle. Or you have a shura. And people had different names for these throughout the country. And these are mechanisms that are used to resolve disputes. And you can see throughout the country they had different names. Sometimes people called them shuras, jirgas. Sometimes people just referred to them as elders. But they represented a mechanism by which people could, use, people could hold uh, resolve disputes or even hold their maliks accountable or hold their mullahs accountable. So what I found is in the villages is not only is there separation of powers between different political actors at the village level, but there were actually checks and balances between them. So if you had a, a mullah who was trying to impose something that people considered as too conservative, one village I recall, uh, the, the mullah was, wanted to ban music lessons. And the villagers were, this was in a Tajik area, and the villagers were very upset about this. So the shura got together and they checked the authority of the mullah and said, no, music lessons are allowed. Thank you very much, mullah. Sometimes maliks would get out of hand and maybe take too much money for resolving a dispute with the government. The shura would come together and check his authority. Oftentimes there were disputes between mullahs and maliks. So one of the, I found that power in the village level was constrained that you didn't see a feudal system, that you saw, I wouldn't call it democratic, but decision making that was based on consensus was due to these constraints, was due to these checks and balances, and also separated authority. Now historically in Afghanistan, there are other mechanisms of informal governance that are used to do many other things. There's the Mirab system, which is a, a customary system used to manage irrigation canals. Um, but in the past 10 years, the international community and some in the Afghan government, remember Dr. Barfield talked about those Afghan elites who view the countryside with disdain, have a very difficult time understanding what goes on there. Or those traditional and customary systems really disrupt, uh, aren't good for development. So there's been a movement to create a new governance structure at the village level. And you can see this, these are called community development councils which have been uh, sponsored by the international donor community, very well-intentioned efforts to build governance at the community level. 
And it's very interesting if you look at the materials produced by the Ministry of Rural Development who's supporting these councils, they call the community councils the bridge between the people and the government. And that language in Dari and Pashtu is very, very specific to the Malik system. And if you go to the ministry's websites, they'll say, we want a new system to replace the traditional system. Because remember, after 2001, people thought there was a tabula rasa. People assumed everything was gone, including the traditional system. And one of the things I found from my research in rural areas was that the traditional system is alive and well, but it's not necessarily the same as it was. Tradition isn't static, it's dynamic. The technology of governance in the rural areas is very different than it was 30 years ago. It's very different than it was a century ago. Now people make decisions using ballot boxes in some areas. I found people electing their malik using ballot boxes. And you can see that people have a lot of confidence in their customary leaders more so than in new donor supported initiatives. People go to their local government officials. Um, the, the customary authorities are the most, customary and religious authorities are some of the most accessible people in the countryside. And you can see that district government officials are also fairly accessible to people, um, even more so than members of the, the, the National Assembly. And this is the formal elected bodies. And you can see the National Assembly and the Provincial Council, these are formally elected, democratically elected bodies. They don't have a lot of um, faith um, in members of the community. And you can see across the board, do you have confidence in your malik in your area? And for the most part, there's not a lot of variation by ethnicity. These are not ethnic phenomena. These are village phenomena in rural Afghanistan. And it's very different from a country like Pakistan. Uh, the legacy of customary governance is very different there. But just one final example that sort of illustrates this dynamic. One of the questions I asked about in the survey had to do with land issues. Because I think land is the foundational local government. Uh, land is the thing that local government governs. In the United States and elsewhere, what do you do with your local government? Property taxes, deeds, things like that. It's no different in Afghanistan. So here, this contrasts the feudal vision that people have of rural Afghanistan. Do you own land? Overwhelmingly, people do. Do you have a state deed? Who, who, who issued the title to your land? Did the state issue your land title? Not so much. In, in central Afghanistan, the answer is yes. That's around Kabul. People have more access to the government. Do you have a customary title for your land? For those people who do own land, overwhelmingly, land ownership is something that is the domain of customary governance at the, at, at the local level. If you have a land dispute, who do you turn to? Overwhelmingly, people either go to their family, or they go to their malik, or their shura, and sometimes they go to the district government. But very rarely do they go to formal courts. So finally, I asked a question about, do you think having, I asked about different models of government, and who, how would, what would it be a good way of governing Afghanistan in the future? And this is a response, um, a question, so I asked about experts, religious leaders, and sort of the most positive response had to do with elders and tribal leaders. That people thought this was a fairly good way of governing Afghanistan, but you can see that there's a big divide between rural and urban areas. That people's understandings of government are very different. Um, so let me just wrap things up, because I think I'm probably over time, but one of the reasons people don't support formal elections at the local level is because they believe that if there were formal ballot boxes at the village level, this would bring the same kind of electoral corruption down to their village. And it doesn't mean that they don't want democracy. It just means that the formal system of democracy that exists in Afghanistan hasn't yielded the intended outcomes. So for that reason, they'd rather keep the state away from their communities. And this is a trend that comes over and over again, that these norms of the role of the state in society are very, very different from the European welfare state. Is that historically in Afghanistan, people want to come to the government for things that they want. So let me just wrap this up with two final issues. If you read press reports about Afghanistan, journalists will talk about, and not you, Carmen, you're gonna to talk tomorrow, um, he's a journalist who'll be speaking to us tomorrow. But a lot of news reports, you always see this about Afghanistan. People talk about, they lament 
the fall of Darlaman Palace and say, in, in place of beautiful European architecture of Darlaman, these narco drug lords have built these poppy palaces. And these are horrific, ugly poppy palaces. But this is what many Afghans like. This is the architectural style that they prefer over Darlaman. But to many outsiders, those poppy palaces represent excess greed. They represent uh, audaciousness, tackiness. Um, they're, they're anathematic to the kind of democracy and the state that's associated with the beauty of Darlaman. But I think what we, we have a difficult time doing as outsiders is appreciating the Swiss cheese, is appreciating the beauty here. I'll just leave you with one final quote. This is from um, a district governor in, uh, who I interviewed in um, Bamiyan province. He's a Tajik area in Bamiyan province. And I interviewed him a couple of days after King Zayir Shah had passed away. This was in uh, several years ago. Zayir Shah came back to Afghanistan. He was no longer king. He passed away a few years ago. And the district governor said, last night I saw a program about Zaire Shah on TV. In one of his speeches, he said that we should move Afghanistan forward slowly. There's an Afghan proverb. We should walk slowly forever, not just run for an instance. If we walk, we can move forward always. But if we run, we might fall down. Amanullah was Afghan, but when he went to European countries and saw all the progress in these countries, he returned to Afghanistan. He wanted to change the country in a day. But when he turned back to the country, he failed. So just to give you a sense of how Afghans view government, I hope this was helpful, and I look forward to your questions. <laughs>